Welcome to Meditation and Aliens with Doro and Matt, a webcast that explores everything we currently know about the truth about aliens, human history, reality, consciousness, and the role meditation can do to help us understand all these things, and how we might all work together to build the best world possible for all beings, human or non-human alike. Meditation and Aliens is hosted by me, Matt Reddy. I'm an amateur ufologist. I have a degree in philosophy. I'm the creator of HiveOne.net. I'm also an elected public hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. Each week, I am joined by Doro Kiley, longtime meditator, meditation teacher, and an experiencer with many stories, and life coach extraordinaire. You can find more about Doro at her website, creationcoach.com. Now, on to the show. And we're back. How are you doing, Doro? I'm doing great. Just enjoying the spring. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. We've taken a, a little break from our normal podcast. Mm-hmm. We had a uh, nice interview that we has not, well, I guess it's been, it was released on the, um, I released it on the audio version of the, the podcast feed, but uh, haven't put out the video yet of our interview with Yemi Janae. Oh, it went really well. Really, I enjoyed that a lot. She's so interesting. What a what a person. Just a great character all around. So, yeah, yeah. Yemi Janae from the Farsight Institute. She's a remote viewer, and uh, it was it was really fascinating to just be able to ask all of all the, all sorts of questions about um, how she got into it and uh, how it works and. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it is a very interesting topic remote viewing it really is you know and the fact that the military uses you know um highly trained remote viewers i mean it just tells you that there's something very real there and you know I, my mom was a psychic and she had psychic friends and so the majority of these kinds of things are 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 probably um, not terribly reliable, but I would say if it's, if it's real, th- this is powerful stuff. Um, yeah. And we got, we kind of got a sense of that through Yemi and you know, she, uh, she really can go deep, I guess. So let's, let's, uh, let's continue. What what else we have for today? Well, um, I've been, uh, as you know, I've been taking that class with uh, Daniel Sheehan and the New Paradigm Institute and Ubiquity University, the the first graduate program on extraterrestrial studies. And uh, so I had the last two classes with uh, Daniel Sheehan and, uh, or maybe it was just the last one. Uh, And one, at least one of the last ones was about the metaphysical, philosophical and theological implications of the UFO phenomena and ET civilizations. What, what impact they're going to have on our society and all those realms, you know, as it, as it, you know, as our society faces the reality of whatever, whatever, you know, these UFOs and potential aliens represent. So was that the the name of your class, the metaphysical, philosophical, what was it? And theological implications. Theological, yes. That was the, just the name of the, um, the third class in his uh, second course. Um, yeah, and so, and you know, I mean, I guess, uh, and actually, and also yesterday, I started the next course, which is with Richard Dolan, and uh, Richard Dolan is like the preeminent historian of everything related to UFOs and the government cover up of it. And he's he's published a couple books that are like uh, two volumes, I guess, of books titled UFOs and the National Security State. And was, uh, he, so, was he part of the disclosure hearings last summer? No, no, he's uh, but he's interviewed all the time on on uh, channels. He's he's a, he's really a historian. He's a really respected historian because he's very rigorous about evidence. He really focuses on the the absolute, you know. Uh, events that we have evidence of UFO sightings with great evidence, you know, and events involving the military and uh, 
the national security state and CIA and uh, project blue book. And um, so it's uh, you know, he's very like scientific minded. He's like a very conservative uh, evidence-based researcher on what's been going on. Um, Great. Yeah. And so, yeah, so that it's been, uh, so that's, that's been fascinating. You know, uh, let me see, Daniel Sheehan had a couple of like, you know, I mean, I guess one of the broad big things that he said was, you know, humanity, you know, we, we have all these big questions about what is the nature of life? Where did the universe come from? What is going to be the, you know, where is the universe going? Is it going to end? fizzle out or is it going to collapse back into a you know uh you know on itself or and and he was like these really big questions about the nature of the universe and nature of life and death yeah he said yeah he says that these the alien civilizations that exist they may have been around so long and have advanced so far that they have definitive answers to all these questions like absolute definitive answers so that they he was like their their uh, certainty about these answers might be an incredible threat to humanity's you know the diversity of opinions and beliefs that humanity holds right now interesting yeah yeah, yeah so he was they, like, don't, they don't have multiple religions and belief systems i mean they just know well maybe he was it was it was basically one of the possibilities he was talking about you know it's sort of like the idea that they might have like uh and they might not have tolerance for us having a diversity of ideas because they feel they have proof they have definitive proof of things so why would they tolerate us believing in different things right that was kind of one of i don't know i found that kind of an interesting uh Oh my goodness. I mean, just how this would all, you know, what does this do to theology? And I mean, it just, it just kind of, yeah, takes it all apart. And uh, so let's hear it. What, what, what did he talk about? Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, it was, you know, at a high level, it was basically, um, I mean, he was just basically like exploring again, you know, like how it would impact how humans, our current metaphysics, our current theologies, um, Let's see. He and he seems to have an interesting idea about uh I guess the nature of consciousness in the universe. He he has this idea he kept on describing of that there is a let me see how he said this. A word for it. Um yeah. Like an un there's an infinite field of undifferentiated consciousness in which we all exist and uh I, I think he was kind of expressing an idea that he believes in but for some reason he believes the 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 extraterrestrials may believe this also maybe because he believes it's true i don't know but it, you know basically it's the concept that you know that consciousness is the fundamental thing of reality and we're all parts of a universal infinite field of consciousness and um I don't know That's, anything. That, that goes right along with, with what I believe. So, uh, yeah, this is good to hear. I'm, I'm listening. Well, so why why do you believe it? Where did that belief come from for you? Oh, you know what? You, I, I don't know. I guess, of course, I've been meditating my whole life. And it's just when you get into that deep place, you just kind of have this understanding that everything is experiencing this deep place when it's quiet. And that's where you feel that connection. Um, it's like, yeah, I, I feel like what I'm perceiving, although I'm interpreting everything differently from what you're interpreting everything, but the actual ability to perceive, I think, is universal. That's what we do. Even trees can perceive. Everything is perceiving in, in its own way. Um and that just comes to, you know, I think anyone who goes into a, a deep practice of meditation can certainly experience that. Mm. Yeah, that's the all, we're, we're all one idea. But when you get into that deep place, you you can experience it. Yeah, I mean, I've had like, um, I mean, I've had moments 
meditating um, and at different times where I've felt the same sort of like truth. Um, it's just sort of a, yeah, it is interesting how different um, cultures and I mean, that idea keeps coming back, but I guess it's the most meaningful thing is that if you experience it yourself, it seems you feel it as it's true. You feel it. It's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I I go with this idea that you know the the universe is like is just like this big uh, toroidal field of plasma, and that's the way I see it. And and as it's been described uh, in, in quantum physics and what have you, so you have this sort of a toroidal blob of of plasma with uh, billions and trillions of of points in it that all have this ability to perceive and uh, and that we're moving in and out through the the center of this toroidal field and you could you could see that on a micro level and a and a macro level and if you if you look at a toroidal field from the top down you're kind of looking through a donut hole and uh, that donut hole is let's let's just take uh reincarnation right so we are going Every time we pass through that hole, we are we go, we die and, we, and then we're reborn. So this is the eternal cycle of karma and reincarnation, just going around and around and around until we have completed every possible point of perception and experience. And then we're just finished. And I don't know what happens after that. <laughs> we can move on, go to the next higher level, to the next octave. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would like to talk to whoever knows, because these are still falling in the category of, you know, philosophy and um, even in physics, you know, the, I don't, I don't know how they can a hundred percent prove it yet, but maybe they have. Yeah. What's your, what is your perception? How, how do you see it all unfolding? Well, I mean, if, if something like that is true, if something like the reincarnation cycle is happening, and i mean the the weird thing about that is how our memories get deleted you know yeah. so it's like you could go through that whole thing over and over again and you know at the end if they keep if it keeps on deleting our memories then they could just keep cycling you through it forever right um yes yeah. yeah, it's, it's the memory thing that seems to me to be really key really a key question of this whole existence that our memory, I mean, even the memories we have of our current life, the, the, this, you know, it is really shoddy. We have such limited memory of our actual history and, and the memories we do have. It's, I mean, what, what certainty do we have that they are actually true? I mean, it's, we have very limited, we, we don't know that our memories are real or, the connection to reality it's right it's all about memory and and but if it we don't have memory if you don't have any memory then it's very it reminds me of what we experience when we meditate and i think about this often when i when i sit to meditate and i get frustrated about what because even sometimes while i'm meditating and i'm thinking about some sort of idea i have you ever have this where you you're you go down this path of some sort of idea and it seems to be the most important idea in the world. And suddenly it's like, it creates some sort of overwhelming feeling of revelation that this idea just opened up the key to solving like everything in the universe and peace. Yes. And yeah, then, that's what I it, yeah. then I forget it. Like, uh -huh. <laughs> and I'm like, and I, and so I like, I, every time this happens, I'm like, trying to okay i gotta remember the pathway to that i gotta remember the idea that took me here i gotta remember the chain and i so many times i've been like i like lose it i completely lose it and i'm like i don't remember at all how i got to this idea or i lose the idea completely uh, i've got to tell you a funny story that ram das once told he you know who ram das was he was uh, richard alpert the head of the psychology department at harvard university that started doing drug experiments and and he went to India and became Ram Dass, a long story. But he was a great speaker. And uh, 
So he used to, he used to do a lot of drugs. And one time he said he was so stoned, so tripped out on LSD or something. And he saw it. He saw everything. He said, oh my God, I understand everything. He says, I've got to remember this. And and he kind of struggled to find a piece of paper and a pencil. And, and he's sitting there stoned out of his gourd and he's trying to write something down. And, and then he finally gets it on paper and puts it away and forgets about it. And I guess a couple of days later, he suddenly remembers that he wrote something down and he comes back and he finds this piece of paper. <laughs> and all it has on it is I-S, is. <laughs> that's it that's it the whole universe it just is <laughs> yeah that was a great story but yeah so uh, yes i do have that on occasion where you just see something and then it's so enormous and then it's gone <laughs> yeah frustrating um, well I, I, lately you know i guess over the last uh I, I i've tried to like just like stop beating myself up for forgetting you know, it, it's like it launches my consciousness into some sort of energy field. And then I, I I sort of have given up on trying to remember the threads or steps that took me there and just be like, just go with it and see what do I understand or can see when I'm just launched into that energy field after I have this, you know, this series of, I, I stop trying to hold on to the, whatever it is, hold on right. to the memories and let it go. And it seems, you know, when you, you know, that when you're meditating, it's like when you just go into the present and just, and just focus on your present experience, it's like, there's something about that, that is always something about that. That's always the same. And it's like that itself is like a reminder of like, almost can be your foothold in, even though you can't hold your memories that that present moment when you close when you close your eyes and focus on it that itself can sort of serve like a memory because it's uh you can every time you touch it you can start to build the same you can start to rebuild an understanding of the nature of the universe mm. does that make any sense mm, yeah i think so yeah i think when you get so subtle it's it's kind of gets hard to really get the words to, to <laughs> describe it but yeah I, I see what you're saying i think i see what you're saying so absolutely i mean so this there's... present moment is all we have you know everything that we all of our memories are are just you know uh we're just replaying thoughts in our head in the moment you know, yeah. the memories are whatever happened in our past doesn't exist anymore. Everything is right now. Yeah. So the past does not exist. The future isn't here. So that's this is all we have. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's kind of, I think, like Eckhart Tolle, probably, I never know how to say his name. He talked, yeah. you know, the power of now. He sort yeah. of says you can use the now as your um, foundation for everything. Just go yeah. back to it and you can, you can. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, well, so let's see. There's, there's a, um, I, I'm tempted to play a thing from another podcast. Um, it's uh, Kelly Chase's the UFO Rabbit Hole podcast. Uh huh. And she had a, uh, she had her 35th episode is called Through the Looking Glass, and in it she describes a a revelation, a revelatory moment of hers and it, it's like i've listened to it several times and it's it, the, the way she describes it is really um powerful and it sort of sim it relates to kind of what we're talking about with this like revelation of oneness of the universe and i don't know it only takes a, like a minute do you want to hear it oh oh yeah definitely i don't know what she would uh, think about us uh i don't think she would mind us playing this one little piece mm. um maybe your buddy's made a switch let me like moment to cue it up here. I don't know where to start. Maybe you've tried vaping. <laughs> that was <laughs> um all right. One moment here. I'm gonna find the right moment. Are we gonna share screen or just listen? No, I'm just gonna play the audio. It's I just have it under audio. Okay. I could sense immediately everything about me had changed. Let's see. Together as a whole in a perfectly orchestrated symphony. 
didn't plan on playing this. Question I don't know. I understood all of their... And he seemed to slowly become aware of the room around him. He shrank back against the wall. I'm totally fine. It's like nothing ever happened, except he trailed off. I just nodded. Okay, so I'm just going to play this this little section. First, she's describing, before she describes what happened to her, she talks about using salvia with a group of friends because yeah. she's like, that's a, that experience is will help her explain the experience she had which she was sitting in uh, on her bed and she had been researching ufos and you know uh you know ancient egypt and everything you know the whole rabbit hole of this ufo mystery sitting on her bed and she had this this moment and so here she's describing first uh, an episode where she would used salvia with some friends and then she goes into her experience so i'm just going to play this um this whole little piece and okay. uh then we can talk yeah. And he left. Now, you would think that that would have been enough for all of us to be done with the whole thing. But as freaked out as I was by what I'd just seen, I knew I was going to try it. I grabbed the bowl off the table and I took a hit. I would say that I was instantly somewhere else. But as soon as the smoke filled my lungs, I wasn't really anywhere. The thing that is me seemed to dissolve entirely. I had no awareness of a self or an identity that was separate from what I was experiencing. And what I was experiencing was being a collection of cells. I understood all of their inner structures and processes. The feeling of interacting together as a whole in a perfectly orchestrated symphony was pure ecstasy. It was a feeling of perfect unity and perfect joy. There was a sense of timelessness that this moment was the only moment and it was eternal. When flashes of the room around me began to tear through the fabric of this unity, it was completely foreign to me at first. I couldn't make sense of the shapes I was seeing. I couldn't tell a face from a chair. I didn't remember any of my friends or myself or anything. It felt like literal hell was invading my perfect heaven and I was being dragged down into it against my will. When I suddenly found myself back in my chair and back in myself, I was gasping for air. What did you see? My friends asked. I didn't know how to answer them. I don't know. I said, finally. And then I excused myself to the bathroom where I sat on the floor and cried. Anyway, where I'm going with all of this is that up until that morning in my room in August, 2021, that was the closest thing I'd experienced to whatever it was that happened to me. It was similar in that it was utterly annihilating. I didn't forget who I was exactly, but I felt entirely detached from that identity. My ego fell away, and I felt like I merged with all that is. I was in unity with the whole cosmos, and the feeling was ecstatic. It was also similar because my experience was very short. It probably only lasted a couple of minutes. But that's where the similarities end. Unlike my experience on Salvia of being a collection of organic cells, this experience felt like being everything that is and was and ever will be all at once. I saw that time wasn't real in the way I conceived of it. Every atom of the universe was made of purpose and meaning, and time was just a way to connect these units of meaning into stories. And the infinite potential connections unfolded into an infinite number of stories, each one unique and precious and essential, but also utterly illusory. Everything is always here. Nothing is ever lost. It was effortless to follow the threads of these stories through the unity of all. I could follow as many as I wanted all at the same time, and I felt my consciousness racing down this connective tissue in all directions simultaneously. It felt like play. It felt like laughing. I saw everything. I saw the birth and death of the universe, which wasn't a birth or a death at all, but a kind of breathing, an inhale and an exhale. I saw the history of this planet and understood that a planet is not what I thought it was. Nothing was what I thought it was. Everything was alive. Everything was sentient. Everything had a sacred purpose. I saw my entire life laid out in a series of tableaus. As I watched them unfold, I felt like some intelligence slid behind me, just over my shoulder, just out of view. Whatever it was, was ancient. And so was I. And we knew each other. We loved each other deeply. Remember, it asked me without words, 
And I replied also without words from the center of my being. Yes, I remember. I can't believe I ever forgot. And I did remember. I remembered why I was born and what I came here to do. And every moment of my life suddenly snapped into place like a puzzle. And I could see the whole landscape of the thing that I had been building without even knowing it. Every moment of my seemingly aimless and checkered life had brought me to exactly where I needed to be to learn exactly what I needed to learn. I'd run from it and denied it and done my best to throw away the best parts of myself. Even in my darkest hours, I had been protected and nurtured and gently guided like a child. There was never any danger. There was never any way to do it wrong. How silly I was to ever think any of this was random. How ridiculous to ever think that I could ever be alone or lost or unloved. I had always been loved. I came from love and I was love. Love was my birthright and my most natural state of being. The love was infinite and effortless. I saw a lot of other things, some of which I remember, most of which I don't. There are flashes of images, vague impressions of deep insights, many of them about things like DNA and gravity, the nature of light and of God. But as quickly as it began, it was over. I found myself back in my room on my bed, only a minute or two after it started with tears streaming down my face and a sound coming out of me that I'd never heard before. That was somewhere between a belly laugh and a scream. As I came back to myself, I felt my mind scrambling to hold on to all that I'd seen, but the images and ideas scattered away from me in all directions, like a broken string of pearls that slipped through my fingers. Within seconds, the whole thing felt like a half-remembered dream. Almost immediately, the feeling of euphoria dissipated as an all-consuming wave of grief washed over me. It wasn't just the sudden disconnection from what felt like the source of all beauty and light in the universe. It was the realization that in just a couple of minutes, I'd been completely transformed. I could sense immediately everything about me had changed. Pause it there, or I'll stop it there. Yeah, very similar to what we were kind of talking about. You know, the, the whole thing about remembering and forgetting is interesting. I mean, I, I do believe that if we fully remember everything, it's game over. There, you know, it's just we all merge into the into unity consciousness and the, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, so there is part of us, I believe, that chooses to come in to this experience and chooses to forget just for just to have the experience. Uh, because I believe that if uh if we are in unity consciousness we know everything we we just we don't have any questions it's you know there's nothing else to learn because we know it all and so in that regard we end up choosing to come in and forget and to to rediscover what we can become or to re-experience i think i think we do it to ourselves i think it's like a video game you know, we we choose to to jump into these lives, take on these bodies, and act out, you know, our dreams and wishes and fears and challenges, all of it. That's I, I truly believe that. If we if we were really fully awake and conscious, uh, you know, we we would just we wouldn't even exist, I don't think. And if we did exist, we'd probably just be sitting in a cave in the Himalayas. We wouldn't have an, any agenda. Um, or just doing what the what the Taoists call, you're just living in the Wu Wei. You know, you're just moving with the universe. You, you're really not doing anything. You're just having this, this sense of movement and participation in something, but you're not really doing it. There's the universe doing it through you yeah i mean i i definitely get that idea of i mean there's been times where i've had dreams where it seems like i go to you know if, if we're going through some sort of reincarnation cycle it, it it's like there is at times we go back to i don't know source or this place where we remember everything just sort of like kelly said you know it's like 
the universe asks you, do you remember? And you say, yes, I remember everything. How could everything. I have ever forgotten? Right. Yeah. And, and then though, we, we seem to either, and then we seem to, maybe we choose to forget a large amount so that we can experience life in some way. Yeah. I mean, yeah. either we choose to forget or we non, it's not consensual and we're forced to forget. It's, it's one of those two things. And if it's not consensual, then that's really sad. We live in a universe with, you know, where our memories are constantly wiped without our consent. So I would like to believe that's not the case. So it'd be nice if we, if this is a free choice that my true self is making to forget all this knowledge and full history and everything for some purpose, for right. some reason. I do. Um, I do believe that. I mean, we, do, we don't make that decision consciously, obviously to come in and forget everything, but I think unconsciously our true self, I, I should say, um, has no problem with it at all because it does know everything it's just playing out this this uh this part in a play you could say we're just, we're all just actors on a stage right that's uh, yeah. shakespeare okay well let's say that's true that my true self you know agreed to have my memories wiped temporarily for this life do i have the right this moment to say hey i'm uh changing my mind i'm vetoing that decision i would like all my memories back do do i not have the right to do that oh you absolutely do i think that's what the whole journey is all about who can who can remember everything before you die <laughs> and you know that's kind of the name of the game if you if you want to continue with the the uh, you know video game scenario Whoever can remember the whole nine yards before we die, then you win. And then you're not, uh, you know, then you don't have to keep coming back into the game and get to the next level. And <laughs> it's a great analogy. But yeah, the, I think that the name of the game is remember everything. And when you remember everything, you see that nothing was ever lost and nothing was ever gained. It's all here. Hmm. Well, why? Uh... Well, anyway, I mean, I've been, there's been several times recently where I've been meditating and I've clearly said to the universe, I want all my memories back. And, um, and I feel like when I've done that, I feel like I could, I mean, I could sense the universe sort of like, um, like, like opening up some bucket of information but it was almost like it was a little scary. Like it was almost like the universe was like, "Are you sure?" <laughs> it was like <laughs> it was. It yeah, was what almost you, careful like, what you wish for. Yeah. yeah, and it was like it was like as it was like opening the box. It was like you know, it was like showing me some of the stuff in there, and it was like it was like some of this is gonna be painful, and some of this is gonna make you feel. I don't, I was thinking like guilt or shame, like, like I, maybe I have some previous lives where I've done some bad things I've been, and it was like, but it didn't seem like that was overwhelmingly the case. It seemed, I felt like maybe my imagination was sort of like, cause it, I mean, I was like, why would the universe take away some of our memories? One reason might be because some of them are really painful and, you know, and are rough or difficult to live with. I don't know. Well, I think we get to the point where we remember that we are not our memories. Yeah. You know, we just know. Um, yeah, it, I, it almost feels to me like a moth drawn to a flame. You know, we it's like, I want that light. I want to experience the warmth of that light. And you know how a moth will just flicker around a, a flame. And, uh, you know, sometimes they they fall into it and burn up. Mm. Yeah. And so this whole idea of craving our that that part of us that we know is that that knows everything. We want to we, we keep trying to remember everything. But if we remember everything, like I said before, this that's game's up. That's that's the end of the game. We win. We win. We fall into the flame and burn up and remember everything. Yeah. Well, I don't but, know. I, yeah. I do want to say to the universe, I'd like all my memories. I would like to know 
I do not like having my memories, uh, my mind being this abbreviated. So uh, I'm formally saying I want all my memories and I don't want my life to end. I want to just have them all right, you know, now and be able to live this life on earth and Yeah, but who's asking? Is it the Matt Reddy, you know, that lives in Washington and, you know, he's the, the artist and the inventor? I mean, who is it that's asking? Because when you really find out that when when you remember everything, then then that identity, that self-identity kind of just dissipates and you just merge into everything. Yeah. You know? But then you come back together. But, you know, the, the one who's asking... It's like you can't you can't say, oh, well, you know, look at me, uh, George, you know, I finally made it to heaven. You know, it, it, it kind of you have to drop the George before you get to heaven. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like what um, what Kelly was saying. And if you if you listen to her full episode there, she describes after that moment where she seemed to get her full memory of everything in the universe back. And then yeah. it's sort of like she couldn't hold it. But she had enough of it. She was like, I'm forever changed. Yeah. And in the next, what she describes in the podcast, the next thing she does is one, she like sits down and she basically writes an outline for her plan for publishing this whole UFO rabbit hole podcast. And, but she also goes, she's, she has a fiance who is in the other room and she has to, she's like terrified to go tell him something of what just happened because she was worried. It might end her, you know, it might end their relationship because she was like, I am no longer the same person after this moment than I was before it. Everything she was like, I am fundamentally changed. Yeah. And she describes going and trying to explain to him. And it goes, you know, he is very compassionate and understanding. And they do, you know, it doesn't end their relationship. But I also got that feeling that when I sort of have meditated and said, I want to know everything, I want to remember everything. I could kind of feel the universe saying it might change your life. Are you sure? <laughs> you know? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I did have a pretty um, extraordinary experience back in the seventies. And uh, I, I call it my world meltdown where my entire reality just dissipated. And, you know, it was not brought on by drugs. It was brought on by um, very intense, you know, meditation and yoga practices. And I was also going to retreats out in New Mexico. And, and I just had this experience where my entire reality just kind of melted. There was no up, there was no down, there was no left, there was no right, there was no me, there was no in, no out. It was just, and, and I came out of that experience, and this this actually went on for a long time. I felt for, for probably a couple of years that I had to rebuild an identity, just had to rebuild who I was in order to just be getting around in the world. So, but yeah, it's, uh, it'll, from that experience, it totally changed my life completely. So if you go there, you better know who you want to be when you come out the other side, because you're going to end up with with nothing and have to create something. <laughs> well, it, it seems like who I am right now is definitely someone that is just like relentlessly trying to figure out what the heck is going on. What is the true yeah. history of aliens and Earth and what would you like it to be? I mean, what's the best story you can come up with about all this? Oh, I, you know, I don't know if there's a, I mean, you know, I just, I just want to know what's true. You know, I don't know that I have a, um, I mean, it would be, I mean, it seems to be one of the things that seems to be coming clear is that, you know, our, that, that earth has been uh, secretly ruled by a group of uh, humans that really is, you know, somehow coordinating with some maybe not so great aliens. I mean, that seems to be the picture that's coming clear. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it's like, that's, but it's like, um, it, but it's sort of like we're in a, uh, a strange prison 
but it's a if you like if you've ever seen a prison movie or there's one like that that is about the um i think it's about world war ii and the prison camps in on in china where there were a lot of americans um captured in these camps in china i think like it's empire of the sun or something there's there's some old with like john malkovich is in one of these and but there's you you're in these if you're in a huge prison camp or a prison, they create their own societies within the prison and they create their own sort of internal government and pecking orders and economies. And so you can actually be very wealthy and powerful and comfortable inside of the prison, you, or you can have more power than other people in the prison. And so it, it seems earth, you know, our governments all might be, in a way a sham but they also are the way that we govern ourselves within the prison planet of earth and so they they do have power and meaning in that sense anyways and so it, it seems that if earth is controlled by some some sort of aliens that basically see us as like almost livestock from at least from some of their perspectives that's kind of a bummer but it seems they give us a lot of freedom to create society within this planet the way we choose. So it's, we have the freedom as humanity, it seems to, to really like, we could still shape a utopia, even if it was still, earth was still technically controlled by some super powerful alien species at a high level. Um, I mean, I'm not saying I like that idea. I'm not saying I would like that that might be true. You know, I just, I mean, it doesn't, I like, uh, I certainly wouldn't like to live in an authoritarian, like Nazi Germany type environment where we were just like, had no free speech and we were like, you know, disappeared or killed if we didn't do what the authorities wanted, but it doesn't seem that's, that's the world that we live in. Although yeah, that's a, that's an interesting concept. I mean, I, from from what I understand is everything is happening. It, you, if you can imagine it, it's happening somewhere. Remember that toroidal field that I talked about? Every single possible imaginable potential uh, thing can happen somewhere in that toroidal field. And in our body, we have these seven energy centers. Some are, you know, down where there's tremendous fear, very dense, very... Uh, terrorizing energies and as you move up you know the energies get lighter and more spacious so it's not what's out there it's how we are perceiving so if we are perceiving a world that is you know hell and danger and you know, trying to get us and you know we've got to be careful at every angle this this exists and if we feel that we are drawn towards it and what that's what we'll experience that's the that's the part of the toroidal field that we are moving into now if you if you can raise that energy to a higher more creative energy where you're not walking around fearful but maybe just more looking at opportunities and potentials and creative ideas then you're moving in towards that reality. Um, but all of the realities are existing. You can, you can, you know, sort of scan through the internet and see everything. But the question is, what are we focusing on? Where is our energy coming from? You know, that because where we are, who uh, you could say it's not what we do and it's not what we say, it's who we are. What is the vibration that I am currently? putting out there that's that I'm being drawn towards um so whenever you see something terrifying out in the world you just look and see how that is is vibrating in your body what's the what's the frequency are you in the first chakra of survival and can you manage to raise that up so that you don't get drawn into that reality because it is out there everything is out there and we we decide where we're going to be in that field according you know depending on how we are resonating is that too is that too crazy that's a very quantum theory actually no i totally um no it makes sense and it uh i mean it it's kind of like oh there's a book um victor frankel man's search for meaning 
um, yeah. he writes about his experience in the uh, in the Holocaust and uh, concentration camp. And he says some, there's some beautiful, beautiful thoughts in there about how, you know, it, you're in a situation and a lot of aspects of the situation you can't control, but it's still up to you to choose whether or not you experience beauty and right. appreciate the beauty of the moment and the beauty of a sunset and the beauty of a moment of creativity or of learning a language from someone, you know, it's, it's like, it's, uh, you choose how you experience, you know, whatever, um, whatever's going on. And by choosing to appreciate life, you are affecting the world around you. It's sort of a, um, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Cause, uh, cause as you change, everything changes. Cause that's the law of quantum entanglement too. You know, we were all just, you know, before the whole big bang and we all came out of the donut hole together, you know, we, we were all together, we were connected. So everything that we experience, we're all, we are all quantum entangled. So whatever you experience on some subconscious, unconscious level, I'm experiencing it just because you are experiencing it. And that's everything. So whatever's going on in the world, we all feel it. We, we don't even have to watch the news. We can feel it. Um, so when I make a, an, an attempt to raise my energy, to think about more, you know, uh, perhaps painting a picture of, of worlds that are much more compassionate and harmonious and respectful of the earth. Though, if I stay focused on that, I can actually begin to quantum entangle that experience into the whole fabric of our reality. That's why it's so important for all of us to be thinking about what could, what could we develop? What, what would feel good? They say it takes 144 dreamers to alter the fabric of the dream that we all have. We're all dreaming this together. I thought that was a nice uh, a nice number to throw out there. Because mm. if we get drawn into the fear, I mean, th th it's true. That's what they are. That's what they feed on. But I, you know, they're just doing their job. There's like, they're like milking cows, <laughs> you know? But if we stand up and say, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to be milked like a cow, you know, I don't want to be putting out all this fear energy that they can sort of nourish themselves on. I want to put out different energy. They can't do anything about that. They can't, they can't, they can try to pull you in, but they, it's really up to us. Who's the they in your. It, it's the, the, they is, and I do believe there are these dark, you know, whatever they are, there's a, there's a force an entity, uh, a, a, maybe just a dark faction of humanity. There's this, there's this hell realm on our planet. We share it. Everything is here. Everything that we can imagine is here. So all of our darkest, most horrific nightmare ideas they're here somewhere. We don't we don't tune to them, hopefully, but they do exist. So that's that's what I mean. It's just the other side of the the light. And you know, I think I think they're it's mostly being um, directed at the reptilians, and maybe that's true. I don't know. Hmm. Well, I've got uh, I've got a new source of information on the reptilians. Oh, good. Let's hear it. Well, it's uh, Courtney Brown is the founder of Farsight that, uh, you know, Yemi works for. And he has two books, which I've gotten a hold of. One called uh, Cosmic Voyage, which was the first one he wrote and published back in like 96, I think. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, yeah, 96. And then he has one called Cosmic Explorers which he published after this in like 97, 98. And Courtney Brown apparently did a ton of uh, remote viewing into all sorts of these questions about the ETs active on earth. And it's documented in these two books. And the, the first book talks about the greys and the Martians, apparently a, a species of humanoid looking beings that from Mars. And the second book though, he 
realizes that the reptilians exist and he goes very deep into several remote viewing sessions about what they are, what they're doing, what they want. And um, so it's uh so I'm, I'm sort of, uh, and I've been sort of, I've been corresponding a little bit with Courtney Brown on Instagram. I send him messages. That's how I found out. Oh, cool. Actually, and so I got a, did, he, he, he digital copies of his book PDFs on uh, his website. You can get for free, mm. but, um, but yeah, so I'm sort of, you know, I've got the Richard Dolan giving the history of uh, UFOs and you've got Daniel Sheehan who has a uh, his own sort of beliefs, but he's also very rigorous and scientific in the stuff he's trying to figure out. And then you've got these remote viewers, Courtney Brown and Yemi that have that, you know, they weave a, a intricate web of information about what they say is going on and um, it's interesting to compare all these different. Yeah. So does uh, Daniel Sheehan and uh, Richard Dolan, do they, do they have uh, anything that they disagree on or are they all just kind of filling in for each other's blanks? Well, Daniel Sheehan and Richard Dolan are, are currently collaborating to create a list of 100 facts about the UFO phenomenon. Oh, nice. And yeah. And so they're, they're working on this right now. And, you know, like one of them is, that there is certainly a, a ton of evidence of the at least four different species of ETs, the greys, reptilians, mantids, uh, humanoids, and um, and tall and short greys. And um, I don't think I missed one. And then, uh, but, but also in this last class, Daniel Sheehan added that there's also overwhelming evidence from abduction stories that there is some sort of like hybridization program going on yeah and it, it had been the first time that he had gone on the record saying that he felt there was there was credible evidence that there uh that, that the i mean there's just too many stories of of some sort of aliens um you know extracting reproductive material from uh, men and women and also even showing you know babies and you know in and having people interact with their children like a, anyway so there's there's evidence of that and um but that's about as edgy other than that they sort of they they Sheehan and Dolan are really you know they seem to be trying to be very rigorous and not like speculate beyond the stuff that they have really strong information for like they both say there is evidence that like Eisenhower has a treaty or, or signed a treaty and that humanity signed some sort of treaty with aliens of some sort but you know there's just not a lot of there's not enough re real strong evidence for it there's, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence and anecdotes that indicate it it also makes a lot of logical sense if ets were here of course they would sign a treaty it would be they, you know at least a secret treaty with some humans it would make sense i would like to see these treaties yeah yeah and 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 daniel did a whole like part of one of his classes was like okay let's say eisenhower did sign a treaty of some sort could it even be valid under U.S. law if it's not known by the, you know, U.S. citizens, if it's not ratified by the Senate? It's like there's rules about treaties, you know, whether or not they put them to be valid. So, but anyways. Yeah, and since not nobody knows about it, how can it possibly be valid? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So, Pretty wild. You know, lots of uh, interesting stuff. I, you know, I'm considering, you know, I, I, you know, if this remote viewing stuff is valid, I'm just I'm trying to like weave together a clear history that, you know, what Courtney Brown and Yemi and the Farsight Institute just like what is the history of humanity according to them? Like and aliens, like what are the factions? How do they relate to things like World War Two, the Nazis, the, the allies? The, and how do they relate to China and Russia and the U.S., North Korea? Um, you know, do they have or Israel? You know, that's a big one, it seems. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah. so, I, so I really am trying to come up, you know, find a picture to understand how these things fit together. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, something big. I mean, the, the whole um, Israel thing. Now, I do, do not believe that this is a religious war. I, I don't know what it is. It's it's some kind of an expansion project, in my view. You're talking about Israel and Gaza? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I would yeah. like to know if, if you know, is, is this like the, the reptilians taking over or is it, you know, the re, the good guys fighting the bad guys? I mean, I would love to know what, what really is going on over there from a alien perspective. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's, mm. and I think it's like, and I hear a lot of people really trying to make this point in uh, discussions and, and even on a, uh, TV and, and stuff is that we have to separate the idea of Israel from Judaism. Like the government of Israel is not the Jewish religion. Right. No, not at all. No. And it's, you know, and, and it, it's such a, such a nasty trick that they say the moment you disagree with anything, the government of Israel does, you're anti-Semitic. It's like, it's the same. It's just like a cruel psychological. It, yeah. It's a trick. trick. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And it's clever that it, it works so well. It's worked so well for so long to just, you know, they just like, no, you can't talk bad about Israel. You're being anti-Semitic if you do. It's it's just like saying, you know, the U.S. government is the same as a Catholic church or something because Catholicism might be the, the largest religion. It's not. Right. So, you know, yeah, I mean, and we didn't even touch on how what you mentioned that uh, you're studying with Daniel Sheehan, the, the whole theological implications Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's just going to turn the whole world upside down if that uh, if that if what's happening potentially is is true. That's <laughs> big. That's really big. Yeah. Oh, there's and there seems to there's clearly a relationship between the ETs, their interaction with humanity and the foundation of different religions and uh, uh, institutions of these religions. I mean, if you look at the Sumerian cuneiform tablets you know you could you could easily say that the uh, god of israel is enlil from the um from the from the uh, sumerian tablets is basically painting the whole picture of what's going on but there's parts missing and they kind of have to piece it together like a puzzle still but they're getting there and they're painting this picture that this original god um was was an alien <laughs> was an, an an anunnaki named enlil uh so yeah that's an interesting story coming out yeah yep oh yeah fascinating time to be alive here it is and i you know and i i appreciate what we do here because we can bring out all this stuff that feels scary and big and you know make everybody nervous uh, but um, I don't think we really have to be scared. I think the whole thing is just where do we want to be in the picture? Um, and I like to just encourage people to to be present. That's the best place to be in the picture. <laughs> so yeah. you want to do a couple minutes of just calming our mind and yeah, absolutely. Grounded. Closing meditation. Closing meditation. All right. So we'll just. Get present, be aware of our immediate surroundings. This is what this is all we can really rely on for reality right now is our immediate surroundings. Oh, well, if you got a MetaQuest headset on, you can't even depend on that. But you can <laughs> you can rely on your breath. Let's go there. So let's take a deep breath. I'll ring my little bell here. So whenever we feel confused or scared or threatened or whatever, if the threat isn't immediately um, upon you, just, just try to be present with what is. Just listening, seeing, feeling, tuning into the senses tuning into the senses. When you really feel lost, just keep breathing. Just keep breathing. Breathing in, breathing out. Feel your feet on the floor. Feel your head on your shoulders, just hands in your lap sounds, maybe you hear birds or a fan running. Our senses are the only thing we can really rely on right now. 
as things are kind of becoming all confused. We don't have to be confused. Being in the present moment is our most powerful place to be. Right here and right now. Notice where your energy is. Is there anxiety? Is there excitement? Just tuning into what you feel in the body. On a scale from one to 10, one being feeling absolutely terrified and 10 being absolutely blissed out, get a sense of where you are in that spectrum. Just acknowledging what is and how we feel can begin to relax everything and raise the energy. Most of the time our energy is like holding a cork under the water, we're so tense. And if we begin to relax, let go of the cork, it will just come up by itself. We don't have to do anything right now. Just breathing. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Dora. Have a great week. You too.